Welcome to Mike's Motor Works, and on this episode, we're going to show you all about our engine test stand and why exactly do we have it. It all happens right now here on Mike's Motor Works. So this is our engine test stand. And as you can see, we got a uh, guest with us today. This is Pop, who's responsible for said engine test stand. And um, we're gonna tell you a little bit about what we put on here, or what he put on here, why he put it on here, and why it's important for maybe the above average enthusiast or hobbyist to have one of these. When did you first acquire this and why did you acquire this thing? Well, we've had it for about two years. And I uh, got it when we did the uh a big stroker uh, for the uh, Barracuda. You got it from the uh, 392, mm -hmm. and you guys saw that first run um, back when we did our first few episodes on Mike's Motor Works. This gave us a way to kind of make sure that the engine was built properly and uh, to make sure that um, no engine leaks were occurring and make sure it was running fine and tuned up right. Is that correct? Well, we're, we're not a factory. We're, we're doing it uh, individually, and uh, we're, we're wanting it to be done correctly the first time but you are gonna have issues. I don't care who's building it. When you're building it by hand like this, you're gonna have a gasket leak here. Yeah, you're gonna have a coolant leak here. And this gives it an opportunity to test and find out if there is any leaks, where they are, and fix them before it goes in the vehicle. Right, so there are other options available. And if you scour YouTube, you'll find a whole bunch of homemade options for engine test stands. Um, everything from somebody just putting a square tube cage together uh, to I've seen uh, somebody put a wood assembly with some four by fours. How come we didn't go that route and you went with this route? Simplicity. Uh, the, the stand itself was not really, in my opinion, that expensive. We added some stuff that made it a little bit better and did more of what we wanted, but it's a matter of ordering it, spending two hours assembling it, and uh, finding some additional parts, you mount the motor, and you're ready to go. So when you got this from Summit, it came with the actual base stand, four mounting holes, right? Mm -hmm. Came with the caster so you can move the uh, stand around. Mm -hmm. It came with a radiator, is that correct? No, radiator is, radiator is optional. Our radiator was optional, good deal. Fuel tank? No fuel tank. No fuel tank. So it basically came with just the just stand, stand itself with the little mounts for the front motor mounts and uh, whatever you're going to use to adapt to the rear. And that was it. This is designed to handle several different ones, but it really works well with the Mopar small block and the LA motor because the front stands on this one are a little different than others. It's actually just got posts that go up and you run bolts through it and holds it in place. The uh, rear of it, uh, the only way to make it where it would work is to find a a manual transmission bell housing, and it bolts. I got several different bolt locations. It'll hold a, a GM, a Chevy small block as well. But there's several hole locations in the back that actually allow you to uh, uh, put different bell housings on it. Um, the drawback with putting on a, a, a manual bell housing is uh, I'm running a um, um, full full size flywheel on it, and we had to do actually some grinding inside the bell housing in order to fit the motor in without doing it in two separate pieces and then having to put the, the uh, bell housing on the engine and then try to mount it up. I wanted the bell housing left permanently connected to it so all we do is unbolt the six or eight bolts from the motor and it just sits right, pulls right out on a lift. Good deal. So let's walk everybody through then um, some of the stuff that you've added and why we've added it and uh, we'll go from there. So we'll just go from the front to the rear. Starting with, I guess, our gauges up here. Um, obviously, we know why it's important to have, say, a tachometer or what have you on there. We went with a digital tack because it was uh, just cheaper. It was just <laughs> part of the, it was part of the kit, and I wanted to have all the gauges, and the, the primary thing you need to see is oil fill, or oil pressure. Um, you don't need a, a volt gauge on this one, but I went ahead and mounted an alternator because I plan on running it. It's not, I don't have a vehicle ready to put it in yet. I haven't decided what I'm going to put it in. Uh, so you, I wanted to go ahead and be able to charge the battery so you don't have to put the charger on it. And then the, the uh, oil pressure gauge, got to check your coolant, coolant temperatures. Um, this motor, as you've seen probably in the other video, 
was running about 180 to 186, which is exactly where I want it to be. And then of course the uh, tachometer. Of course, when we're doing our tuning and testing, my test light has tachometer and uh, we, we verify it with it. This only reads in hundreds. It, it doesn't get down to the, the uh, actual numbers like my handheld does, but that gives me an idea where I'm at. And this motor seems like it's running the best about 1200 RPMs at idle. And um, I, I added in the uh, oxygen sensors, uh, wide bands, so we can actually see the burn. And with the uh, O2s, you want to be a true burn, perfect burn is 4.7 or 14.7. And right now this is running 13.8, 13.9, which is fine. I'd rather it be just a little bit richer. Uh, but having that actual gauge on there makes it really easy to determine what you want to do with the jets. Now we've not messed with the back jets on this carburetor yet. We're working solely on the front jets because you can't get into the back jets, Louis. It's sitting right here right now. It turned eight or 9,000 RPMs. <laughs> we're not ready for that yet. Sure thing. So the only other thing that we added up here is you drilled in a switch <laughs> for the electronic uh, fan control. Is that correct? Yeah, before I was running uh, on, on the, the 392, we were running a mechanical water pump. And uh, I don't need the switch. It does have a sensor that's mounted in the water jacket that turns it on at mm -hmm. 180. Well, I might want it to come on a little earlier. So this actually is a bypass. I can actually make it come on when I want it to come on in case it's getting hotter than I want it to or I mm -hmm. feel it's getting hotter. And coolness in this, you, you've got to have heat to get performance, but you also got to have cool to keep it from blowing. Exactly. So we got a um, aluminum radiator uh, that said was an extra portion of the uh, an extra option that we added on. And of course, we got all the coolant lines that we need, etc. So working our way back from this thing, of course, uh, if you can't see it here on the camera, there is different ways to adjust here the height of the radiator and all that kind of good stuff. Is that correct? You just well, that here. That's the pinch bolts at the bottom mm -hmm. that, that hold the radiator in place. OK, the radiator came from Summit. It's actually designed to be in this kind of format. Uh, all they got is a big square groove in the back that mounts into. So you got to put some little oh, okay. gasket pieces to hold it in place. And then you press this totally up against it and then tighten it and it holds it. You know, it's, it's, it's solid in there. Uh, talk to us a little bit about the headers, why you went with these headers and, uh, um, you know, why our option. Because some people are probably looking at that going, man, those headers are really, really tiny for this small engine. Why did we go with these particular headers? Well, this is a test stand. <laughs> it's not the final product. And uh, I was looking at the least expensive method to put something on that would be operational. And these are aftermarket bolt-ons. Um, they will work in a vehicle, in mm -hmm. most vehicles, with the uh, 318, 340, 360 motor. But I wanted something compact, and then I wanted to do... Uh, I could run it wide open, it's just noisy and you can't really hear the motor well. And I wanted to hear the motor and do the testing on it. So uh, we went ahead and put glass packs on it. They're a little bit noisy, but you can still hear the motor running very well. But these are just simple aftermarket, um, make it work scenario. Of course, when we get ready to, to dial this thing in at the dyno, it's gonna have performance uh, exhaust on it. Good deal. Yeah. All right, and then we also briefly, you were talking about, um, and John covered this the other day, where you added the O2 sensors with the bungs and what have you, uh, feeding up to the uh, area in the rear yeah. deck back here. I mounted it here in the rear where you can, if you need to. The thing about this carburetor is you don't really have to do much. Uh, <laughs> you turn it a couple turns out and you're done. Right. And match all of them, makes the same. That's one of the nice things about this, the, uh, uh, brawler mm -hmm. is it, it, it's fairly simple easy to adjust with the auto control easy valve there. yeah in fact i went in and attempted adjusting these things it did not change huh. the oxygen readings at all so i just left them where the factory said needed to be which is a turn and a half out yep and then this this is a, the whole key to making sure that you're not leaning the motor too lean or getting it too rich and that's i, I recommend anybody that's building an engine stand and going to actually test motors to have Right. Capability of doing that. So even if they are running either injected or anything else, carbureted, injected, doesn't matter. Just make sure you get the O2 on there to make sure you get the right ratio. Is that correct? That's good. Yeah. Good deal. Now, talk to us about this back panel because this did not come with the kit itself. Um, this was something that you added. And as you can see here on the camera, um, you got little brackets that are going to the bell housing, kind of holding this piece up. And it's all attached together with some particle board in the back and some uh, uh, just looks like just standard sheet metal. Is that all you use on top there? It's aluminum. Aluminum. OK, there you go. Aluminum. Uh, aluminum conducts electricity. And uh, I need to have a ground that's capable 
everywhere around because it's a grounding system. Mm -hmm. And it's separated from the positive side. And you've got components that need to be mounted to it, like the fuse block, because I don't just run one fuse feeding everything, especially since I'm running an alternator, it's on a separate fuse circuit. Mm -hmm. um, the distributor, separate, separate circuit. Uh, the fuel pump, separate circuit. They've all got their own particular fuses that they're running. So it, there's no place, and I didn't want to leave things hanging back on the back. Just, right, just hanging out there. And so I mounted the distributor electro electronics to it, the uh, O2 sensors, and all the fuse blocks. It does take a starter relay to start this thing. Mm -hmm. So I mounted the, uh, the Chrysler starter control module for the, uh, or the relay for the uh, starter. And it makes it a nice little convenient. When I take it apart, there's two bolts that's tied through to the mm -hmm. engine. And it just sets and hangs there. Okay. So it, it works out really nice. Good. The hard thing is getting wires to it, but it, that worked out fairly well. you got to run a strong power line where you're feeding most all of the components. And then a little bit lighter line that feeds others that are, again, separate circuited up in the front. And then you've got other items all part of the uh, gauge package that have to be hooked up to be able to see uh, how it's actually doing and what it's doing. Good deal. Now we ran into a little electrical gremlin when we had the 392 set up because when we did our first initial uh, non-coolant, just see if we can get it fired, we had spark. Fast forward a week later, we put coolant in it and then we finally had no spark, couldn't figure out what was going on. I had to completely rewire this in the back here, didn't we? Yeah, um, the, the Dodge system, the way they do it is a, a little bit unusual and um, they use various parts that I had and had them installed and mm -hmm. wired correctly, but it just didn't seem to do what it needed to do. Well, the EFIs from the Chrysler, or the Chevrolet, which is, they find these things mounted actually in the distributor, the Chevrolet units, throws one heck of a good spark. Mm -hmm. And it does the exact same thing that all that extra stuff, the computer box and uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, Dodge has, but it does it a little bit more efficiency okay. or efficiently. So this came from General Motors. That's and just well, yeah, it came from just a parts house. It's an aftermarket. It's not the market. It's just the General yeah. Motors design. I, I do have an, an MSD to put on it, mm -hmm. but I'm just testing the motor. Right. I, it's not a big deal. Now, when we get ready to hook it up at the dyno, it'll have the MSD on it. Okay. Which I don't know that is that you know big of a deal. When I uh, ran the 440 back in the 80s, uh, we used a standard Chrysler. Mm -hmm and we use a standard coil, and we ran nine seconds. So. Right, I think for the Mopar, because the, there is such a great, uh, and this is my understanding of what's out there, um, you know, the Mopar and factory, you know, back in the 70s, just had a great electronic yes. uh, system set to it that produced a lot of spark, um, but when you're getting to the MSD, you're gaining more control of that spark, where you can yeah, uh, we have can, more control of where the spark initiates, yeah. watch your rev limiting and all that kind of good yeah, stuff. That's true. So I think there are some advantages to have that there. Good deal. Is there anything that we missed on the engine test stand that you think is important for viewers to know about? Well, the test stand itself comes with a tray in the front, uh, which is where we've got our battery sitting and we've got a, a container, a five gallon bucket to catch any coolant if it does overflow, which it's never done. Mm -hmm. Um, mounting wise, it works out really good. We just put a two gallon uh, aluminum fuel tank on it. Um, and that's enough to run 20 minutes or so at uh, uh, idle plus some throttling to see how the motor actually sounds. Mm -hmm. And I put an electric fuel pump on it as opposed to a mechanical fuel pump. So you can do much, just about anything you want to do with it. It just depends on what your plans are doing. You can leave it full mechanical. You don't need to have all the fuses and stuff. You can run a motor on it. Um, you know, just hook a, a, a battery charger to the battery to charge the battery because it won't take long with the electronics firing up right, to, to draw the battery. battery down. Yep. So uh, that's why I did the alternator. Other people might not want to do that, but to me, like I said, we don't have a, a vehicle to put this in. We have not decided what we're going to do, and I wanted to be able to run it so that it doesn't just sit. Right. And that's what this allows it to do. Good deal. Thank you all for watching and uh, keep, and don't hesitate, click that like, click that subscribe button. Share this information with your uh, friends and if they like uh, building anything from Mopars or a standard hobbyist, because that's what we are, we are hobbyists. We might have been focusing on Mopars for his first few episodes and such, but we are just essentially hobbyists, at least I am. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode.
See, that was easy.